Chautauqua 2010 is brought to you by the Maryland Humanities Council, a private educational nonprofit organization that stimulates and promotes informed dialogue and civic engagement on issues critical to Marylanders. Angela Rice Beamer and I'm here at the Germantown campus of Montgomery College for a living history program called Chautauqua. Tonight a scholar actor will portray a very influential figure in American history. Although his reach was international, he's best known for his work in the United States. He used the law to challenge racial barriers in education, voting rights, housing, and transportation. Our theme is Beyond Boundaries and tonight's Chautauqua character is Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. You all want to know about my life? So nosy. So nosy. Well, I'll tell you. I was born in Baltimore, Maryland on July the 2nd, 1908, in what was called a nice colored neighborhood in Baltimore, Division Street around Pennsylvania Avenue. My mother and my father were both hard workers. My mother was a school teacher. And my father worked for the B&O Railroad, which in those days was a good job for a colored man. They both insisted that my brother and I get an education. They were so adamant about that. I had an older brother by the name of Aubrey who just seemed to do everything right. Uh, any of you the oldest in your family? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. You get pressed into being executive director whether you want to or not. And Aubrey made life very hard for me. He was so successful. He did everything right. He went to school and actually did strange things like study. And when I went to school, I went to play pinochle and look at the girls. I was kind of tall and cute. And you know, it was, uh, well, that's how I learned geometry. And, uh, but my mother always said, now Thurgood, you be sure you study those books because that's the ticket to a successful future. And my father just backed it up, you know. Boy, you better get over there and read them books now. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you again. And my father, when he had a break from the B&O Railroad, would take us down to the courthouse, what you all call the Mitchell Courthouse today, so that we could watch justice being done. And of course, the first thing we notice is we have to sit in the back of that courthouse to watch the proceedings. There is some justice for you. But we watched all kinds of trials, civil trials criminal trials, murder, petty larceny, and then we'd come home and discuss it, which is about the only time I could discuss anything controversial with my father, because you know how fathers were in that generation. They had the last word, even if it wasn't the right word. And if you objected too strenuously, they would, well, let me put it this way, they would put some Zoom in your Fruit of the Looms. <laughs> but that's how we learned about the law. And my brother Aubrey was interested more in science. And when he went to school, we went to the school that was called a normal school, a colored normal school. Now, that was the most ridiculous term for a school I had ever heard. There was nothing normal about it. It was segregated. It was inferior to the white school. And they had nerve enough to call it a normal school. I figured after a while, they just said, let's just go on and call it Frederick Douglass or something reasonable. And we went to that school. And every time I would get on the teacher's nerves, which was quite pretty frequently, the teacher would send me down in the basement where the furnace is with a copy of the Constitution and make me memorize portions of the Constitution in the basement. I want to tell you, by the time I graduated from Frederick Douglass High School, I never knew every word in that Constitution. <laughs> I didn't know what it meant, but I knew every word in that Constitution. Now, Audrey, and I didn't get along all that well. He was just too much to follow. He went up there to Lincoln University about an hour and a half from Baltimore up there in Oxford, Pennsylvania, 
And he studied all those exotic subjects, biology and chemistry and subjects that I even had trouble spelling. And he put a lot of pressure on me back there behind him. But my mother said, Thurgood, what are you going to do when you graduate from high school? Well, Mama, I'm going to do what most boys do when they graduate from high school. They go to work. See, back in those days, in the teens and 20s, you didn't automatically go to college when you came out of high school. You went to work. So going to college was a big thing. Aubrey had already gone to college. He was doing well up there at Lincoln. So I eventually applied and got accepted at Lincoln University. And when I got up there, there were about 150, 200 colored male students up there at that school, but not a single colored teacher, not one, not one. Most of them were white teachers who had graduate degrees or undergraduate degrees from places like Oberlin, Yale, Michigan, and it just seemed that they were there to do their practice teaching on us, uh, and, and we objected, privately to ourselves, of course. <laughs> but being up at Lincoln University was a new adventure for me. How many of you can remember the first year you were away from home? First year you were away from home. It's different, isn't it? I mean, on the one hand, you wonder how you're going to make it from day to day, but on the other hand, it's free at last, free at last. <laughs> And I met a lot of friends there at Lincoln University. We played cards. We talked about everything, usually about except our subjects. And I met some fellows from different places in the country. They weren't all from Pennsylvania or Maryland or New Jersey. Uh, some of them were even from Africa, from the Middle East. There were a few from India. And I remember this intense young fella from the Gold Coast. Oh, he excelled in every subject, and he was very focused. And he said, I must focus on my studies for the liberation of my people. And this fellow uh, called himself Kwame Nkrumah. And he said, you know that same white oppression that you are experiencing here? We are experiencing over in the Gold Coast as well. And he used to pal around with a fellow from Nigeria by the name of Namde Ezekiwe. And this fellow would go on to be the head of this country. And then uh, there was a, almost the opposite of them, also originally from Rochester by way of Baltimore, a, a party person to a much greater extent than I was by the name of Cabell Calloway. Now, he had gone to Frederick Douglass High School, but he spent a year up there at Lincoln mostly, you know, party. That's what he liked to do. He liked to entertain people. And he was good at it. And the man could dress. Oh, he could wear some clothes. I mean, these were the only clothes I ever saw that had a decibel level. Okay. <laughs> uh, he was good. That, you know that Heidi Heidi hole number he used to do? Oh, yeah, he practiced that at Lincoln University. So we met those fellows. And then we met a very intense young fellow who seemed to commute between Lincoln University and New York City. He was a few years older than the rest of us, and he had already published poetry and essays and little short stories, and his name was Langston Hughes. Now, Langston Hughes came along at a time when something called the Negro or Harlem Renaissance was just getting started. Oh, it was a beautiful time for colored people. The arts, literature, sculpture, painting, oh, all kinds of essays, Arna Bonton, Alain Locke, County Cullen, all of these people flourished during this time. And Langston Hughes was connected to that. But he embarrassed us. He said, you all are at a colored school and you don't have any colored professors? Shame on you. He didn't say it quite that way. He said it a, a little bit more eloquently. And he organized a referendum to get at least one colored teacher on that school. And you know we voted against that referendum the first time? That was my first direct lesson in civil rights. How sometimes even the people who are oppressed don't understand the depths and the meaning of their own oppression. Hughes embarrassed us so much that when he organized the referendum a second time, we voted overwhelmingly to get a colored teacher on there, and we got two. Victory number one. And that started to tell me a few things on the inside about change. 
And then for recreation, recreation is a big deal. Every Saturday, big bus full of women would come in from Philadelphia. Oh, we couldn't wait. We call them cute chicks. Oh, my goodness. Well, they just came to help us with our assignments on the weekend. That's all. <laughs> but I got to thinking now, if they're that beautiful and they're coming from Philadelphia, there must be thousands more in Philadelphia itself. <laughs> Maybe I ought to go there and investigate on my own. But then when I didn't have money to go into Philadelphia, we would go into town to the theater in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Now, this is above the Mason-Dixon line. In Oxford, Pennsylvania, there was a little theater. And it was the practice, even in that theater, of putting the colored people up there in the balcony while the white people sat down in the loges. Now, this is not in the South. This is in Oxford, Pennsylvania. And I thought to myself, this is the stupidest system I've ever seen. Don't these white people understand strategy? We could tear them up from that balcony up there. <laughs> and two or three of my friends decided that we would just sit down in the loges just to see what would happen the next time we went to that theater. And we sat right down there in the front. And we weren't in that seat but a few minutes, but we had, boy, what are you doing in this seat? And when I started standing up, apparently that fellow didn't know how tall I was. And by the time I finished standing up, he was gone. <laughs> Second civil rights victory. But I did go into Philadelphia on a number of occasions. And uh, I figured I knew a little bit about Philadelphia because one of the books that we were assigned, I think it was the only book that we were assigned that was written by a colored author, was written by the great Negro scholar, W.E.B. Du Bois. And it was called The Philadelphia Negro, a major social science research project. And it was on the seventh ward of Philadelphia. So I figured if I read that book, I'd learn a little bit about Philadelphia, and I did. And I went into Philadelphia, and uh, well, I went there, let's say, just to investigate things. And uh, I was on 46th Street near the University of Pennsylvania one day, and out of one of those buildings came the most beautiful woman I ever saw in my life. Now, men say that all the time. But I really mean it, folks. This woman was overwhelming. Oh, she looked like a movie star. And she was colored on top of that. And I was wondering what she was doing at the University of Pennsylvania because it was my understanding that they didn't accept any colored students. And I went up nervously to talk to her. You gentlemen know what I'm talking about. When you really are smitten, some of you are smitten by the women who are sitting next to you. You know, they probably smoked you last night. Okay? Uh, and I, I was nervous, and I uh, introduced myself, and she introduced herself, and she said her name was Vivian Bure. I like the way she said, Bure. And she was studying to be a librarian at the University of Pennsylvania. She was a little bit ahead of me in her studies, maybe a year. And I fell deeply in love with this woman. Now, just to give you an understanding of how deep this was, I did like a lot of women. And I was willing to put them all behind me just for her. And after about a year and a half, I even proposed to her. And the first thing she said is, Thurgood? Are you familiar with the concept of work and employment? <laughs> and even though interiorly I wasn't, I said, yes, absolutely. And uh, I took her down to meet my parents, and oh, they loved her. My mother said, she's beautiful. And on top of that, she can finish raising you. you know? <laughs> and uh, all my father would say, go on, boy, that's right. You know? And we got married before I graduated from Lincoln University. I called her Buster. And people said, what do you call your wife Buster? Beautiful, elegant, brilliant, educated woman. You called her Buster? Yeah. Why? Because she was. <laughs> and uh, that name stuck. And I called her Buster for the rest of the time we were together. Now, as I got to my junior and senior year, Aubrey had graduated from Lincoln and gone on to Howard University Medical School. Now, Howard, in those days, was the Harvard of all the black schools. Lincoln was the Princeton. And he was down there at the medical school embarrassing me because I was just graduating from school, graduating from college. And my father said, Thurgood, what are you going to do now you graduate from college? You going to get a job or what? Yo, yeah, I'm going to get a job, Dad. But my mother said, 
is this the end of your education, really? And Buster said, this is not the end of your education. <laughs> and I thought of going to law school because I spoke pretty well. I argued even better. And I was an imposing presence when I stood up. I was a tall fella, you know, and after a while, I had a few biscuits in me. Uh, I looked pretty big. And I wanted to go to the University of Maryland Law School because it was walking distance from my home. And I started to look into it and discovered that those people at that school did not accept colored students under any circumstances. Was I upset and angry at the same time? Just thoroughly. I almost gave up the idea. And my father said, well, what about Howard University? They have a law school. Yeah, but dad, the, the students down there who graduate from that school don't pass the bar exam. You know, they don't seem to do that well. I mean, Oh, but, but, but they're good. They got a new dean down there who's shaping the place up. You better check it out. And I applied and got accepted. Now, you have to understand that this is the 1920s. There was no Interstate 95 and 295. And it took an hour and a half or more to get down to Washington, D.C. by train. And when I entered that law school there, there were only seven of us freshmen sitting in the row together. And this new dean came in. And boy, he was like a military man. His name was Charles Hamilton Houston. And he came in and looked down at us and said, gentlemen, look to your left and then look to your right. The fellow on your left won't be here next semester, and the fellow on your right won't be here next year. That caught our attention. <laughs> Hamilton Houston was serious. And to show you how serious he was, this is a man who graduated from high school at 15 or 16 years old, graduated from a white school, Amherst, up there in Massachusetts by the age of 19, went to the real Harvard University Law School. Not only did he graduate at the top of his class, but he was the first colored editor of the Harvard Law Review. That wasn't enough for him. And in those days, when you got your law degree, there was no JD. It was LLB, Bachelor of Laws. So he went on and got a Master's of Laws at Harvard. Took two more years. Then he went on three more years and got a doctorate in something called juridical science, something I'd never heard of. And that wasn't enough for him. He went to Spain and got another doctorate. The man was unbelievable. And he looked at me. I should say he looked through me. And he took me aside and said, son, if you came here for a party, you're in the wrong place. Might as well leave now. Save us both sometime. I said, no, sir, I'm really serious. I mumbled. <laughs> and he took me under his wing. And he said, uh, we're going to focus first on constitutional law. Now, keep in mind that the law school at Howard University was in the basement of the building it was in. So here I was in the basement again, <laughs> studying the Constitution. He says, I want to tell you about this Constitution, Mr. Marshall. It is a fabulous Constitution. Understand that at the time that this Constitution was ratified in 1789, most countries didn't have a Constitution. And the ones that did started right out in their document concerned about the powers of the monarchy, the powers of the military, the powers of the landowners, all men. They might incidentally mention citizens, but they wouldn't start with them. This Constitution's first statement after its preamble is, all legislative authority is vested in the Congress of the United States, the people's institution. He said, it's a wonderful document, a flourishing Bill of Rights, almost an afterthought, first 10 amendments. He said, but you have to understand, Mr. Marshall, that this Constitution was not intended for us. It did not apply to about two thirds of the humanity that were in existence in the former colonies at the time. If you were a woman of any background, including English, it didn't apply to you. If you were an African, slave or free, all it said was that Congress could regulate the slave trade across the states. And when it came to the process of reapportionment, determining how many members of the House of Representatives a state could elect, we would count as three-fifths of a person. Now, at my weight and size now, I would love to be three-fifths of myself. <laughs> but they didn't mean it as a compliment. Understand, Thurgood Marshall, that this Constitution made American Indians, the original inhabitants of the land, a foreign power. 
We fought a terrible civil war over slavery in this country because we misunderstood our own constitution. We lost nearly 700,000 people. Even at the end of that civil war, a deal was made between the North and the South that the former slaves, the freedmen, would be incorporated into the body of the citizenry. But all most of the southern states did was turn the old slave codes into black codes, he told me. And in response, the Union government imposed military rule on the South, dividing them up into five military districts, each one presided over by a Union governor. Howard University is named after one of those Union governors. Hamilton Houston told me that because of the Reconstruction, Republican leaders like Thaddeus Stevens up there in Pennsylvania and Charles Sumner in the Senate from Massachusetts insisted on having these freedmen in the South registered to vote. They insisted equally fervently that they be registered Republicans. <laughs> so between 1870 and 1901, he told me, 22 colored members of Congress went to the Congress. 20 to the House of Representatives, two to the Senate, and the two from the Senate of all places were elected from Mississippi, one replacing Jefferson Davis in the U.S. Senate. Hamilton Houston told me that the first Civil Rights Act, I didn't even know what civil rights was, was passed in 1866, still on the books. Became the basis for the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, he told me, and the reason they went to amendments is to keep the Democrats from repealing the statute. There was another Civil Rights Act, he told me, in 1875 that had something to do with public accommodations. I didn't know what that was. But it was access to hotels, motels, inns, theaters, streetcars, things like that, on the basis of race. But the United States Supreme Court struck that statute down in 1883, setting the stage for perhaps the momentous, most momentous decision of the late 19th century. And that was Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896, he told me. Homer Plessy, light-skinned colored man from New Orleans, thought he could ride any place on the streetcar he wanted. And it ended up being at the center of a court case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And the courts decided that they would recognize the 14th Amendment on their own basis, on their own grounds. Oh, yeah, we understand that due process of the law in civil cases and equal protection of the law, but we think you can be racially separate and equal at the same time. A brilliant piece of logic. <laughs> Hamilton Houston told me that women had just got the right to vote just a few years ago as a result of the 19th Amendment, and Indians had just been voted citizenship by an act of Congress, not even a constitutional amendment, conferring certificates of citizenship on them. Hamilton Houston said to me, son, this is why you are in law school. This is what you are here for, not just to make some money. This is your chance to not only change our condition, but to make America address its own ethics. Oh, he was adamant about it, and he practiced it. He was engaged as an active, quote, civil rights lawyer. And he said, uh, I know you're working. I know your daddy got you a job up there at the B&O Railroad. I heard about it. Your wife insisted on you working. And I know that the, the minute you got up there, you wore one of those little white coats, waistcoats that the porters wear there. And I know that the pants weren't long enough for you. And you complain about it to your white boss. And that white boss looked you in the eye and said, boy, don't you understand that it's easier for me to get another nigger than to get you a long pair of pants. I kind of understood that you made it throughout the summer with those short pants on. But I'm going to get you a different job. I want you to work right here at the Howard University Law Library. Now, this was a small school, small library. Oh, Buster was just so elated. Books, library, and Thurgood, all in the same place. <laughs> Hamilton Houston is the reason that I graduated top of my class coming out of Howard University Law School. I passed the bar first time. He connected me to some of the cases he was working on.
But I put out my own shingle right there at 4 East Redwood Street. Had a little office. Oh, I was something. Had my little two suits. But most of the clients I got were colored clients with no money. Young black men accused of raping white women. Teachers who were not paid anywhere near the salaries of their white counterparts. Okay. Union folks who were just trying to get a decent wage. Yeah, people like that who didn't have any money. And after a while, I was about as poor as they were. I mean, uh, you know you're poor anytime you pay for something in cash and the cash bounces. Okay. <laughs> and I was approached by a gentleman who was also a Harvard graduate, who had been the head of the German department at Howard University, who started a newspaper called The Afro-American. His name was Carl Murphy. And Mr. Murphy was connected to what was going on there in the Baltimore chapter of the NAACP. And he and that fiery young woman who was the president, Lily Mae Jackson, approached me. And they said, we want you to help us work on some of these cases as our general counsel. And all I saw were dollar signs. Finally, some work. Lily Mae Jackson went through every one of those 15 to 20 cases in great and exhaustive detail. I said, boy, I'm going to be really in the cahoot now. And she said, oh, by the way, we don't have any money to pay you. <laughs> but one of the first cases that came up was the case of Mr. Donald Murray. Donald Gaines Murray. This is a young man who graduated from Amherst College, near the top of his class, who was trying to seek admission to the University of Maryland Law School. <laughs> I took that case on for free. When I heard about that case, something in, inside of me went, <laughs> 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 yes, sir. I took that case on, and we fought it all the way up to the Maryland Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said, well, the University of Maryland argues that he should go to Princess Anne Academy over there in Eastern Shore, which you all call the University of Maryland the Eastern Shore today. I argued, have you looked at the curriculum of the University of Maryland Law School compared to the curriculum of Princess Anne Academy? You tell me in the curriculum over here at Princess Anne Academy where the introductory courses in contracts, constitutional law, uh, professional responsibility, criminal law, you show me where that is, and I will accept the fact that Mr. Murray can go there. Well, the Supreme Court of Maryland agreed with us. Said you have to admit Donald Gaines Murray because there is no colored law school in the state of Maryland. And we got him admitted. And then we turned our attention in the NAACP to other civil rights issues like voting rights in the case of Sweat versus Painter, in the case of Smith versus Allwright, we took on the white primary. Now, this was a way to keep colored people from vote. Oh, they would use all kinds of devices. You couldn't vote in the primary at the party level. That meant you weren't there at the general election level either. They made you read chapters from Hamlet if you wanted to vote, or pay money. And we challenged that in the, in the courts. I want you to know this because of what I'm about to tell you before I sit down in a few minutes is that the real heroes that you should be focusing on is not Thurgood Marshall, not Charles Hamilton Houston, but all those little people who put their lives and their livelihood on the line to protect their families and their children and to work with us to advance equality, not just for colored people, but for white people too. Don't you understand that if we have a society where everybody has access to opportunity. We are much more competitive, and everyone's better for it. Everyone is better for it. It's not just for us. So in the 1940s, we were approached by a reverend down there in Clarendon County, South Carolina. He was an ordained minister, a pastor, but he's also the principal of the Scots Branch School. Now get this picture, Clarendon County, rural county in South Carolina, had about 3,900 students, 2,700 of them were colored students. The colored students uh, were in old barns, old buildings, and inside that building they'd have one old pot belly stove to keep them warm in the winter. The teachers would teach every grade level. The kids worked for sharecroppers and tenant farmers, and they would walk three to five miles to school and from school every day. 
So Reverend Dulane went to the superintendent, the white superintendent, Mr. Elliott, and said, our children need a bus like your children do. Give us your oldest bus, even in a state of disrepair. We'll fix it. We'll make it operate. We'll pay for the gas. The superintendent said, we don't have any buses for your colored children. Delane, undeterred, came back the next week and asked again. And the superintendent jumped up and said, I told you we have no buses for your colored, your nigger children. Delane called us up right away. And we would not intervene in a case until 22 people signed a petition for us to come in. And we took up this case in Clarendon, South Carolina, in the case of Briggs versus Elliott. And of course, we lost in the South Carolina courts. But I want you to know about this case because those people, those colored people in Clarendon, South Carolina, are the real heroes. They're the real heroes. We would not have had a case without them. And that would become one of the five cases that would constitute the famous case of Brown versus the Board of Education. There would be other cases in uh, Farmville, Virginia, in Delaware, in Washington, D.C., and of course, in Topeka, Kansas. We won a case at the Supreme Court on the issue of restrictive covenants, keeping colored people out of certain neighborhoods by supporting real estate practices that refused to sell them property in a white neighborhood. This was all before Brown. We won two cases in higher education, Sweat versus Painter in Texas and McLaurin versus the Oklahoma Board of Regents in Oklahoma, where Mr. McLaurin was admitted to the graduate school, but the school wouldn't let him sit with his own white counterparts in the class. He had to sit by himself. I want you to know also that there were a lot of colored people who objected to what we did as well. They were fearful of change. They thought they were going to lose the little bit that they had. We went to a meeting of the Journal of Negro Education, and here is two or 300 educators at Howard University sitting in the audience objecting to everything that we were doing. My staff tried to answer the questions. I sat silently. Finally, I had had it. And I'm famous for my temper. I want you to know that. I got up and looked, glared down at that audience for 30 seconds and said, can I guarantee victory? Can I promise you success? The answer is no. But do you want to continue dancing to the tunes of the Southern white governors who will decide whether or not democracy's benefits will be conferred on your children's children and their children's children? This is 1952, almost 100 years since the Emancipation Proclamation. Well, those people get, got up and gave me a standing ovation. Now, this Brown thing was not easy. I want you to know that very quickly. We failed the first time to convince the court. Thank goodness for Felix Frankfurter. He said, look, let's stop right now, reconstitute this, and come back answering the question, did the 14th Amendment intend? for there to be integrated schools. In the meanwhile, Chief Justice Vinson died of a heart attack. And Eisenhower appointed Earl Warren, the next Chief Justice, one of the great blessings for us. When we went back, we were a little bit more prepared. But we still didn't know whether we were going to be victorious. And when that day came, May 17th of 1954, we were all in the courtroom with our hearts in our hands, hoping. Earl Warren read the decision. Looked like it took him forever to get to the point. And finally, he said, on the matter of whether or not segregated schools harm the colored children, we believe that it does. And the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. There was a gasp in that room you would not believe. Now, I want you to know that that was the beginning of the end for us. We had to go back and get the court to define what they meant by desegregation in Brown II, and that's where they came out with all deliberate speed. Now, 
I wish I had more time to talk to you because there's a lot, many more details of this case, many more details of this story. Yes, I would eventually be appointed to the Circuit Court of Appeals, and I would eventually become the U.S. Solicitor General, and Lyndon Johnson, who I loved, would put me on the Supreme Court. I love Lyndon because we like to drink and tell ribald jokes and smoke, and, and I love his accent. I just love that accent, you know? I have two semi-beautiful daughters <laughs> and two very ugly dogs. <laughs> oh, I loved them. But when I went on the Supreme Court, I want you to know that this was torture for me. It was torture. It was no joy on the Supreme Court to see the years of work and risk that you had endured dismantled case by case. So, ladies and gentlemen, as I go to my seat, I want to emphasize three things to you. Number one, the issue of race in the United States, or for that matter, any form of discrimination, is not just about the victimized population. It's also about the soul and the meaning and the direction and the future of the oppressors as well. Two, whoever you leave out, you pay for. Pay for them now, pay for them later, you will pay. And most important, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to understand that the next chapters in this story have to be written by you. Whatever you do every day in your lives, you write the next chapters of this story for America and the world. I urge you to write them carefully, write them elegantly, and write them eloquently, because I'll be watching. I'll be watching. Thank you very much. I'm Angela Rice Beamer, and I'm here with Laniel J. Henderson, who's just performed as Thurgood Marshall. Thank you very much for coming to Montgomery Thank College you. and doing Thank that you. performance. It's a wonderful performance. Thank you very much. Uh, now, my first question is, uh, Justice Marshall's life uh, is kind of an example for young people of sort of turning things around, because he started out not a very serious student, but as after he sort of gained that discipline and he was able to go on to do great, great things. Uh, what kind of advice would you give to a student who is not taking their studies seriously or, or perhaps their purpose in life? Seriously? Well, aside from taking their studies seriously, I think what happened to Marshall was that uh, he saw through his experience at uh, Lincoln University uh, what possibilities there were for change, even in little actions like desegregating a local theater uh, or getting a black professor at a, at a black school. And so that helped him. And then, of course, when he went to Harvard University Law School, uh, the mentoring of Charles Hamilton Houston and uh, William Hastie were just absolutely invaluable to him. So I would urge young people, aside from their parents, because parents are a little different dynamic, get a good mentor. And the mentorship is, is such an uh, extreme point, right? And, and that support in general. He had a very supportive family, he did. didn't he? He did. Mm -hmm. uh, had a nuclear family, older brother. Uh, older brother was a physician. So both uh, he and his brother did very well in the end. And uh, his mother was a school teacher. His father worked the entire time. So he had a very constructive nuclear family. And I think this is also a story about nuclear families in that generation, how critical they were to the raising of the next generation of, of uh, outstanding people like Thurgood Marshall. Tell me a little bit about um, of his, uh, his, his wives. His first wife, uh, Vivian, died she early. Did. She did. Uh, she died at 44 years old. They had been married 26 years. And uh, she was really his life in many ways because she was such an inspiration to him. She was educated at the University of Pennsylvania, so she was a college grad. She was uh, really a beautiful woman, striking. Uh, they wanted a family, but she had three miscarriages, unfortunately. She died of cancer 11 months after the Brown decision, which was a devastating development for Thurgood Marshall. And so, uh, uh, curiously, we don't have a lot of archival material about uh, Vivian, who we called Buster, 
but we know from past experience and from uh, the accounts of others how important she was in his life. And she did not mention she had cancer, is that correct? For a long time long she didn't. Mm -hmm. She didn't. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so. And I, I want to talk about um, his, his second wife, uh, Cecilia, also. Yes. Um, how did they meet? And Cecilia worked at the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund. Uh, and so they knew each other even before uh, you know, Buster passed away. And they were friends. Uh, they were friends. And uh, it was some months and years after uh, Vivian's passing that they uh, became reacquainted. She was from Hawaii originally by Filipino ancestry. And she was very, very supportive of Thurgood as, as Vivian was. And uh, she bore him two sons who were both uh, uh, prominent young men, uh, practicing attorneys in Virginia. And so, and she's still living. So uh, he, she too was a great love of his life and he enjoyed his time with his family. He was a great family man, something a lot of people don't know about Thurgood Marshall. And his sons loved him. They loved the attention that they received from him. Uh, and as busy as he was, he always had time for them. I, th I think the theme of, of sacrifice uh, is in terms of the support kind of runs throughout because uh, uh, you, you want to talk a little bit more about that? Because Huge. Uh, I think uh, Thurgood Marshall's entire life is a testament to sac sacrifice. He could have been killed at any moment given what he was doing. Uh, going into the South, trying these cases, challenging the legal system, challenging segregation. Uh, he could have ended up dead and almost did in uh, Mississippi. They almost lynched him. And so that was one kind of risk and sacrifice. And then the other thing is that he sacrificed great personal wealth. Uh, he was a very effective attorney who would have been a dazzling corporate attorney or a real estate attorney. Uh, but he chose to do something with the law that would change America and change the plight of uh, African Americans and other people who had been oppressed. And that's an Im Im immense sacrifice. He did not die a rich man. He was also a very humble man in many ways. He uh, was not interested in a lot of honors and honorary degrees, and uh, uh, he was very humble in a lot of ways. And he had a wonderful sense of humor uh, on top of that. But, uh, but I think he is the epitome of sacrifice, uh, the long hours that you had to work to prepare for these cases against opposition that was well-financed, uh, had legal uh, staff to, to burn, uh, had assistance and infrastructure available to them, and he didn't have much of that. He had just loyal people working uh, with the NAACP. And so uh, it, it's an amazing story of, uh, of sacrifice right to the end. How did he prepare for cases? Uh, did he practice with other attorneys? Did you find that in your readings? Or especially Brown, let's say, a, a case that was so It's a very critical. good question because uh, the evidence suggests that uh, they mulled over and fought over these cases uh, ceaselessly. Uh, they were up all out of the, in, of the night uh, working uh, different angles of the case. They would try something and then he would say, that's not going to work, they would never go for that. And they would argue about it and they'd come back at it again. Then they would uh, uh, work with their volunteers. They had a lot of white and black social scientists and historians who worked with them, who would come in and help them uh, do the research for the cases. So. The preparations for the cases were absolutely exhaustive. It was not unusual for the staff to work 16 to 18 hours a day or more if necessary. And uh, so uh, when you thought of all the years that they were doing this, it was amazing that Thurgood Marshall lived for as long as he did because, you know, of course he smoked and he drank a little bit, uh, but uh, they were very meticulous uh, about every jot and tittle of every case. They had to be because of the Supreme Court itself the court system and because of the opposition. Right. Uh, the, 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 he used. He was renowned for the logic that he Absolutely. used used Absolutely. in the cases. Speaking of the Supreme Court and, and the defense, what was his relationship like with John W. Davis? Well, he admired John W. Davis. In fact, uh, the rumor is that he cut school when he was in law school. Some of his friends and he to go watch John W. Davis litigate when John W. Davis was the Solicitor General. He was that good. So he was an admirer of John W. Davis, and he was in awe of him, and intimidated to a very great extent uh, when he found out that Governor Byrne of South Carolina had retained the services of John W. Davis in the Briggs case, one of the five cases that constitute Brown. So, uh, and they were very cordial and respectful toward one another. Uh, Davis, uh, you know, congratulated him. In fact, 
the Brown case was the very last case that uh, Davis tried before he died. And so they had a very, very mutual, uh, sort of mutual respect for each other. Not he antipathy, not, uh, not uh, they didn't see each other as enemies. Even yeah. though they were on opposite sides of the They were definitely on, them, absolutely, yes. But who were his knuckleheads? I heard that he, uh, you, you tell us about that, that the phrase that he, he uses. Well, any, any one of the team could be referred to as a knucklehead at any time. Uh, and, uh, you know, young William Coleman, who had the Harvard Law degree and who was uh, uh, the clerk to Felix Frankfurt, the first black man to be a clerk to the Supreme Court, uh, was very young when he came and worked with the NAACP. And, and the way Marshall would sort of break him down to size is to call him a knucklehead and, and call him dense and, you know, sort of put him in this place. Uh, and I think every member of the staff at one time or another was dressed down by Thurgood. He had a way of intimidating you and he was a very large man and very imposing and he had one of those I am the Lord type voices. And so uh, uh, he, I think, took turns sort of, sort of picking on people, but they knew that uh, he still had a great affection for them. In fact, they threw a wonderful birthday party for him one time in which they gave him a beautiful new Lionel Lions uh, toy train set. And he was so excited. And they gave him the little engineer's hat to go with it. And Buster came running out and said, we forgot one thing. Sorry, Thurgood. And he said, what is that? Those little short pants you used to wear when you worked for the B&O Railroad. <laughs> okay. That's good, that's good. Uh, his uh, father was a very interesting man in that he would debate with him uh, sort of as a, as a matter of course, so that yes. sort of it's training. Tell us a yes. little bit about that. I, I, I like to describe his father as an intellectual circumscribed by racism. Uh, had racism not been there, his father would have been a professor. He could have been an educator. He had that bent. He had an intellectual curiosity that he passed on to his children. I think it endeared him to his wife, who was a school teacher. And he would deliberately uh, take them not just to the court, uh, to see how justice was done, but he would, uh, in, every other Sunday, he would take them on rides in different places in, uh, in the metropolitan area to expose them uh, to what was going on. And he would sit down and talk to them. And, uh, and he was tough on them. He was very, very tough on them. So, uh, you know, like many men of his generation, uh, he, the, the boundaries were very tightly drawn on what he could do in spite of his immense intellectual ability. And so uh, he's one of the tragedies, I think, of racism to a very great extent. And yet he raised two wonderful sons and had a wonderful marriage uh, before he died. And, and in a sense, that's part of what the sacrifice is, is part of the sacrifice. It propels the next generation Correct. forward. Correct. Mm -hmm. um, his mother, what was she like? Well, she was a, she was a school teacher, and school teachers in those days were uh, an authority figure, uh, both in the school and at home. And uh, they didn't teach, uh, as school teachers often do today, in specialties. They had a tendency to teach many different kinds of subjects. And she was that kind of teacher. And she had a master's degree, which was very unusual for a teacher at that time. Uh, so she was quite well educated. And uh, she was quite capable of teaching in the social sciences and the natural sciences. She taught math at some point. So uh, in a sense, she complemented Thurgood and Audrey's uh, education with a kind of informal homeschooling. Uh, along with the father's exposure. So they were doing homeschooling before we called it that. And the mother also at the same time was a very gentle person. Uh, she was not an overbearing person. She was a church going person and, uh, and yet very strong. Very strong uh, black woman. And I think also Thurgood got his nose from her. Because when you look at photographs of mom and you look at photographs of Thurgood, you can see that nose. Um. I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, his time on the Supreme Court. I read in a book by Davis and Clark, uh, Warrior at the Bench, uh, the, the, that's part of the title, that the Supreme Court was a monastery of intellect. Did Thurgood Marshall feel that way about it, or, or how did, how, what were his feelings about the court? Well, I, I think he might agree it was a monastery. I don't think he would agree that it was a monastery of intellect. Uh, I think he uh, was very bitter about many of the things that happened on the court. He felt there was a lot of grandstanding, there was a lot of ego, uh, that the court didn't really get to all the fundamental issues uh, in many instances. And as he went on, uh, especially as Warren Burger became the Chief Justice, he became increasingly bitter 
uh, about the orientation of the court. So uh, he felt to a very great extent that they were abandoning a lot of the foundation that had been established not just with Brown but some of the civil rights cases that preceded Brown. And he also felt that they were on the wrong side of some other public policy issues uh, that range from abortion rights to uh, housing to police to criminal justice and law and criminal law. So he really was embattled during the time he was on the court. And, uh, uh, and as he went on, he would not hesitate to challenge even the chief justice in some instances. He would always do it with the decorum of the court, but he was quite uh, direct. And, and unafraid to uh, uncompromising. Uh, uh, I read that um, one of the things that he asked law clerks before they came was, "Do you like writing dissents?" And <laughs> That's right. And, That's and right. if they did, didn't mind it or liked it, Absolutely. they were hired because that was where he. Absolutely. Um, what about the uh, some of his classmates? Uh, at Lincoln, he sort of landed in the class with these people who went on to do such Absolutely. illustrious things. Uh, did he talk a lot about that you know, in, in what you read? Well, actually he did. Uh, his time at Lincoln University, in a sense, was his introduction to the world because he not only met, uh, in, well, he knew uh, Cab Calloway, of course, but uh, he met people like Langston Hughes there, and he met uh, a very young Kwame Nkrumah, Namde Ezekiwe, and others who would go on to be prominent individuals in their own countries, and he would keep abreast of what they were doing in those countries when they went back, which is why he would later on uh, be on the scene when they won their independence and they were trying to write their constitutions. So uh, these relationships were very formative to, to him. Uh, they opened his eyes and they were as critical as his courses in some ways because he always said that uh, to be an effective jurist, uh, you had to know the law, but you had to know people better. And he was good at knowing people. And uh, so with those two things, uh, he was able to go much further than someone who just knew the details of the law. So as he went and litigated in, in these southern courtrooms and so on, he could speak to colloquialisms with judges, sheriffs, and so on. And he would say, now, you know, come on now, sheriff. You know that that's not the right thing to do. And so on. Now, you know, a more formal uh, jurist wouldn't do that. So he was very good with people. He knew people quite well. And I think that was the secret to his success, along with his knowledge of the law. I also read that sometimes in those southern courtrooms, he would drift into this southern Absolutely. accent uh, uh, to he, uh, bond, in a sense, uh, with his opponent. He could mimic anyone. And uh, some, some, uh, some old southern fellow told him one time, you know, we, we've got to go slow, go gradual. He says, well, it's been almost 100 years since the Emancipation Proclamation. Is that gradual enough for you? Wow. Talk a little bit more about his uh, international work. You, you've touched on the, the constitution of, of some international uh, countries. Uh, he was sent to Korea to Yes, he was and, sent and to Tokyo. Yes, to Japan and mm -hmm. to uh, mm -hmm. Korea to look, uh, uh, look in on the conditions of uh, black soldiers who were in very, very unfavorable uh, positions there. And, and one particular that uh, he focused on were those who were arrested in the service uh, for insubordination or for other infractions uh, much more frequently than their white counterparts. And so he was able to get the uh, sentences of, an, of, of 22 or 23 of them, I would say 40, reduced while he was there. Uh, it was quite effective. But he finally had a meeting uh, with uh, General Douglas MacArthur, and this was a Waterloo in some ways. This was a confrontation. And he asked him why these soldiers were being put in harm's way in these inferior positions and not being recognized uh, by them. And MacArthur, uh, in his own way, sort of told him, well, you know, the black soldiers were really weren't at the same caliber as some of his other soldiers. And Thurgood really confronted him and, uh, you know, looked eye to eye. And uh, the word was that it was MacArthur who faded away. <laughs> okay. uh, because, again, uh, Thurgood was so incensed by what was going on. Uh, but Thurgood had actually kept uh, abreast of what was going on all during the build-up to World War II, uh, largely because of the concerns that African Americans had about getting into defense-related industries. So he was aware of the efforts of A. Philip Randolph to persuade President Roosevelt uh, to, to issue an executive order banning racial discrimination in defense-related industries. 
Uh, so, and, he, and he knew the connection of that to lend-lease to the war effort in the Pacific and the war effort in Europe. So he was always sort of abreast of things global uh, all of his life. This wasn't a new thing to him. What about your personality is most like Marshall? Um, sense of fun, uh, sense of humor, uh, the belief that uh, whatever we're doing is serious business. Uh, but humor also is serious business because it's a way of relating uh, to people and incorporating them in whatever you're trying to do. Uh, so I think there's a similarity there. I think uh, we also are risk takers. Uh, even getting involved in this play was a risk. And, and, and thanks to the Maryland Humanities Council who's been so supportive, we've, we've gone along with it. But actually the play was written for a professional actor. And uh, so, uh, but Marshall was a risk taker. He definitely was a risk taker. And uh, I think the other commonality is uh, a sort of ongoing uh, interest in fairness, in justice, uh, especially for uh, women and for children. He was very interested in cases involving children's rights, something that's little known about Thurgood Marshall. And I also have a, very, a great interest in, uh, in, in children and the welfare of children and making sure that they have a nurturing environment. We belong to uh, our church's mentoring program and so on and so forth. So those are the things that we sort of connected with in the character. Also his uh, respect for his wife uh, and his listening to his wife. Uh, and uh, I've tried to practice that. Uh, also because the beds in the homeless shelter are just too small for me. So. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so, so very much. It's we have privilege. really enjoyed it's it. Uh, I do hope you come back with some of your other characters uh, soon to Chautauqua in Maryland. Well, it's a privilege and thank you very much. And thanks to the Maryland Humanities Council for the opportunity. Yeah, they're wonderful, aren't they? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for joining us. You've been watching Chautauqua Beyond Boundaries. I'm Angela Rice Beamer from the Germantown campus of Montgomery College. Good night. Mm -hmm.